take care of our needs physically and spiritually, emotionally, and help us to be strong in you as we trust in you. Be with our missionaries as they're serving you and everything's changed. And give each one wisdom in their life on how best to uh, practice ministry and serve you. So Father, bless our service today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Just before our children's sermon, I want to just note the passing of J.I. Packer. He's one of the most famous evangelical Christians that the world's known. And he was 93 years old. His most famous book was Knowing God, the Attributes of God that I used in Multnomah when I was a student. And I got to meet him at Regents College in, I think, 2001 when our son was a student there. I went up to visit him, and we went in the library, and my son Dan said, see that guy over there in the library? That's J.I. Packer. And no one was in the library, so I walked over and talked to him. And he gave me a hard time for going to Dallas Theological Seminary. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a big article at ChristianityToday.com online. And I encourage you to look him up and read. He was born in England and uh, lived his later life in Canada. But a very influential author and speaker, J.I. Packer, and he's with the Lord today. All right, Florinda, come and share with us our children's sermon. Control. Can you hear me now? So, I have brought, Allison, can you see this? This is a remote control. For those of you headbangers in the parking lot, it's a remote control. And why are remote controls so important? Why are we just have to have it? Because remotes are used for what? Televisions. They control your television. Very important. So, this remote right here, and I like to use it, remotes do a lot of things for televisions. They not only control them, they help them, what I like to call, they help them function. They help them turn on. They help them get brighter when we can't see what's going on. Remotes are very important. Did you know that God has a remote? It's crazy, but he does. And I actually have it right here. It's pretty awesome. It's called God's Word. And God's word is our remote for our lives. God's remote that he uses for our lives can do a lot of amazing things. They can stop us when we're going too far and we just need to take a moment. They can make us louder when we're really quiet and we need to speak up. They can rewind us when we miss something and we have to go back and look at it. They can also, God uses a remote for this for our lives sometimes, puts the mute button on we just need to stop talking, right? So I have this verse that's talking about control, and I'd like to help say that it's not so much control, it helps us function. That is what the remote's for. And remote for our lives is God's word, right? So it says, this is in Proverbs, which kids, that's the Old Testament. It says, in your heart, you plan your life. But the Lord decides where your steps will take you. So that tells me, to make it simple, it's this. God has all of this. And God has you too. So you don't have to worry about who's in control or who's going to take function over your life. God's got it. So just relax today. Have a great day. And remember, God's got it. Back in the mid-80s, I only had one car. We only had one car for a long time in our marriage. And I'll never forget when I opened, when I were able to buy a second car. And it was a Chevy S10 pickup, blue. And it was used, and it had a five-speed. <clears throat> I remember taking it to Portland. And one of the problems with that truck, it had a stiff clutch. Boy, was it difficult. And so, I was on the Banfield Freeway that goes out uh, east toward Gresham, and it was rush hour traffic. I knew the city well, Martha's family lives there, I went to school there, and I'm stop and go traffic for 40 minutes. 
My left knee was talking to me so loud, <laughs> slipping that clutch and stop and go traffic for 40 minutes. I hated that clutch. I hated that truck in that situation. And today, we have something that has revolutionized cars. We have an automatic transmission. And that automatic transmission has made all the difference in the world. 30 years ago, 71% of cars had automatic transmissions in 1990. Today, 96% have automatic transmissions. You can hardly get a stick shift anymore. And a lot of people don't even know how to drive them. Even the new semi-trucks on the freeway have automatic transmissions. Lou was telling me, there's only a gas pedal and a brake pedal. That's all there is in a modern semi freeway truck. And how great it is to have these new inventions. You know, I thought about some other things. <clears throat> I thought about uh, telephones. Hey, Sarah, can you ring me up? Uh, and now we have the rotary phone, and then we have the push button phones, and now we have cell phones. How far things have come. You know, we used to beat clothes, uh, our clothes on rocks. Not me, but uh, somebody did. And, uh, and then we had the washboards, and then uh, finally the modern washing machine, which I don't know how to work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I did an article, I, I did a, a paper in the Army on the use of aviation in, in warfare. And the first time they ever used aviation and warfare was during the Napoleonic Wars in 1800. You go, well, they didn't have airplanes back then. They had hot air balloons. And they were dropping bombs from hot air balloons in 1800. My, how far that industry's progressed with spark bombs and our jets and our fighters. And it's come a long, long way. I think in every area of society, there's been improvements made. And out with the old, in with the new. You know that your Bible is divided in half. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, originally, the Old Testament wasn't the Old Testament. It was the Jewish scriptures that Jesus used in his life. And he always said, according to the scriptures. One of the famous phrases is, according to the scriptures. And the scripture was the scripture. But when the New Testament came into being through Christ, as he instituted the new covenant, in his blood, that now we realize there's a new covenant, a new testament. And the word testament is identical to a new covenant, a new agreement. And so it has superseded and surpassed the old way. And now the, the scriptures of the Old Testament are now called the Old Testament. And the reason they're called the Old Testament is because they've been superseded by the new. The Old Testament was a clutch, a manual clutch, and your knee got so sore, and you loathed it. It was so burdensome, it was so troublesome. And we come to the New Testament, which is an automatic transmission, that is just so wonderful. And we have to see how great it is and how outmoded it is. If you'll turn in your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter seven, 11 through 19. We're going to look at our sermon today entitled, A Better Hope. Out with the old, in with the new. We've been studying the book of Hebrews that were written to Hebrew Christians who were new to the Lord, new to the new covenant, and they had trouble giving up their clutches. They had trouble getting uh, moving on from the old and embracing the new completely in 100%. And the author of Hebrews is saying, leave the old. It had its place. It's had its purpose. But it will not give you salvation. It will not give you what you need in your life. And so you need to embrace the new. And so the main thought this morning is since the Levites and law could not make you perfect, a better hope is offered to us through Christ. And so here is the challenge before us today. We've been studying about Melchizedek, 
an ancient person that lived in Abraham's day, a mysterious figure, a magnificent figure that we studied last week. How great Melchizedek was. Well, we've learned who he was. He was either a type or figure of Christ, or he was actually Christ himself appearing in the Old Testament. And Abraham, as great as Abraham was, the father of the Jewish people, he paid a tithe to Melchizedek as we give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And so he did. And so here we see Melchizedek continuing in this discussion. And Melchizedek supersedes the Levites. It's a different order of priesthood than the order of Levi. And it makes that big point through this. So as you see here, the new order of Melchizedek. So let's look at verse 11 as we begin this morning. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? One of the purposes of the law, and of really of all religion, is to make us acceptable to God. To make us, in this context, perfect. And what that presupposes is that none of us are perfect. We're all sinners. We're all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. And we're all seeking how to become perfect in God's eyes. How to become perfect so that we can be with an all-holy God. Here the little word if, in Greek, you can study this and tell if it's first, second, or third class condition. This one is a second class condition, saying it's an impossibility. That'd be like saying, if I was a Martian. Well, I'm not a Martian as far as I know. And so it's an impossibility. And so with that Greek second class condition, if perfection could have been attained, and it was impossible. If perfection could have been obtained through the Levitical priesthood, which was really synonymous with the law of Moses. It was all one legal system of the Ten Commandments, the 613 ordinances, the Levitical priesthood that administered the tabernacle and the sacrifices. If all of that, if the Old Testament system, could have brought you perfection, and it couldn't. It's an impossibility. And that's what we see here in this first situation. And this is what we read in the scriptures. And so here you see it could never perfect anyone. It could never make you what you want it to be. We know from the book of Galatians that the real reason God instituted the law and the Levitical system he did it temporarily, only for 1,500 years. Moses got the Ten Commandments in about 1,500 B.C. And 1,500 years later, Christ came and fulfilled the law and instituted the new system, the new covenant, the new testament. The new law of Christ, as it's called in Galatians, the law of Christ. Not the law of Moses, but the law of Christ, which is the new covenant. And it's through that new system, that new automatic transmission, that we can be perfect in God's eyes and attain the perfection that we're looking for. And so he is challenging these readers. You can't stay stuck in the old way. You can't stay stuck in the past. It does not work. Well, what did work about the old way? It says it led people to Christ. It led people to frustration. It led people to say, this way doesn't work. I'm going to go for the new way. And it taught us that we were all sinners. Before I go on, I want you to know that in the Bible, it calls the law perfect. There was really nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. There was nothing wrong with the law. It is perfect. But what it was imperfect in, it could not make you perfect. <laughs> It in itself was perfect, but we're imperfect, and we couldn't keep it. We're all sinners. The problem's with us, not the law that God gave. 
So God gave us a new way called the new covenant in his blood that we celebrate each and every communion Sunday. Look at the uh, second part of this verse. It says, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? I want to go through the rest of this sermon with six new things, as long as we're camping on the word new. Six new things that God has brought us that supersedes the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. And the first thing is a new priesthood. And here it's after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother. Moses and Aaron were from the ancestor of their tribal leader, Levi. We get the, the name of Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, from the tribe of Levi. They were the priestly tribe. They were inextricably linked together with the law, the priest and the law together. Why did a new priesthood have to be implemented? Not after the order of Aaron and the Levites, but after the order of Melchizedek. I'll make the statement and then I'll prove it. The reason is, is because the law through Aaron, the law and the priesthood through Aaron was ineffective and it would not work. And so we had to have a whole new system. This system, a new order of Melchizedek, is not mentioned in Genesis 14 where we encounter Melchizedek for the first time. 500 years after Moses, King David lived king of Jerusalem. And he wrote in Psalm 110.4 he said that there is a new order after the order of Melchizedek. After 500 years, David through the Holy Spirit writing the scriptures said there's going to be a new order. And the reason he said a new order after Melchizedek is he realized and God spoke to David that the old order will not work. And it's not working. And David, I want you to prophesy that a new order is coming. And the new order is after Melchizedek. Psalm 110 4. Psalm 110.4 is quoted in our passage down in verse 17. Look down there. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. That's the first time in the Bible that we see order of Melchizedek. A new order has been instituted. Why? After 500 years. It only took 500 years. And David goes, it's not working. We need hope for a better way. A new priesthood. We need Jesus. And there's the prophecy. This verse is quoted so much in the New Testament. Psalm 110, 4. So there is a new priesthood. First announced by King David. And realized in our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. When you change something, the whole system changes. Everything changes. And you think about going from a manual clutch to an automatic transmission. Everything changes. It affects everything. These new semi-trucks have electronic ignition. They're all electronic everything. It's all tied in with that electronic transmission. And it's all integrated and works together as a harmonious system. And the driver doesn't even have to think about it. And he can concentrate on the things he needs to think about. And here a new order has been instituted. And that implies that there's a new law. The law of Christ. So just because you get a new priest doesn't mean you keep the law. Even the law is affected when you get a new priesthood. It's interesting to find out in the scripture that in Galatians, it's in Galatians 6.2, it mentions the phrase, the law of Christ. Well, it's like the new covenant isn't a system of laws that we follow, but it's put in there to say we're under the law of Christ today. And what is the new commandment that Christ gave to us that we should love one another? That's the system Christianity is under today, love. You shall know them by their love. Do you love each other? Yeah. You glad you're fellowshipping today with each other? Yeah. You look like a bunch of bandits out there. <laughs> I think I'm preaching to a hospital ward. 
But you love each other, right? Amen. And you can love God with a mask on. You can love God without a mask on. Wherever you're at, you can love God. And they should know us by our loves, by our love for one another. And so we're under the law of Christ today because the law could not make us perfect. But I'm here to tell you ahead of time, Christ can make you perfect. And that's why it's a new and better way. We find out in this text, look down in verse 18 of our sermon this morning. The former regulation is set aside. That's the Levitical law. It was weak and useless. It couldn't help you. It wasn't that it was ineffective in itself. It was our inability to keep it. We're the problem. And so because of our inability to keep the law, it's net effect. It was useless and it was weak. And my knee hurts from trying it. It's killing me. I can't do it anymore. Give me an automatic transmission, please. It's fantastic. You can have set it on cruise control. It works. And so we find out that the law appoints men who are weak. Down in verse 28, it talks about the weakness of priests. There are mortal men who died. And even the men who implemented the law were weak. And it was ineffective. The law was canceled by the cross of Christ. It was canceled. It was set aside. In Colossians 2.14, having canceled the written code, that's the Old Testament, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, because it condemned us as sinners, and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. What did Christ do with the law and the Levitical priesthood system? He canceled it, null and void. He nailed it to the cross. It died. And Christ said, I am the new law, the law of Christ. There's a new sheriff in town, and it's Jesus Christ. And it's the new covenant in his blood. And that's why we're Christians, and that's why we embrace the new covenant. We cherish the old. We appreciate the old. But it will not save you. It will not make you perfect. It will not get you in. All religions in the world present to you a system of do's and don'ts whereby they say you can make yourself acceptable to God. The five pillars of Islam. I always go, they have all different kinds of rules and regulations depending on what religion you're looking at. And I love Howard Hendricks, my teacher and mentor, who's now with the Lord, who spoke at Easter Sunday service in our church back in the 80s. We're so glad to have him for at our house right up the street for dinner after church. And then he got on an airplane to go to the next place. But Howard Hendricks, and he, uh, he said all religions of the world are, are trying to reach up to God. They're trying to have a system where you can reach up to God and get higher and higher and attain perfection. And the Bible says we all fall short. I mean, way short. You, even, even the tallest person in the world falls way short of God's standard, right? But true Christianity, I'll say there's a big segment of Christianity that I believe is a false religion. They call themselves Christians. But they have a system, just like the other religions. Religious Christianity, not going to get you there. But true born again Christianity is God reaching all the way down to us. All the way down to us. And what did Jesus do? He came down from heaven. And he came all the way down to our lowly estate. And he picked us up. And he carries us. And it's all because of him and none of my trying. My trying only gets me to about eight feet. Uh, God came all the way down. And save me. And that's the unique thing about Christianity. God condescended. He humbled himself. He gave up his glory in heaven to come all the way down to earth and die on a cross and 
set the example for us and to save us from our sins. And that's the only way you can be acceptable in God's eyes, the law of Christ. And so he's writing these Hebrew Christians, leave the old and the old, appreciate it, but move on completely and 100% to the New Testament, to the new way of living. The law of Christ in Galatians 6.2 now supersedes the law. Galatians 3.23, before this faith came, we were held prisoners of the law, locked up until the faith could be revealed. Think of those Old Testament saints in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. They were locked up in the old way of living until faith could be revealed. And Abraham found faith in the eyes of the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness, Genesis 15, 6. How is Abraham saved? The same way you and I are saved today, by faith, not the Levitical system of the law. And those Old Testament saints found faith in the midst of the old system. How much easier is it today to find faith in the new system after the death of Christ on the cross as we look back and cherish that moment? Galatians 3.24, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the law does have a purpose to lead us to Christ, to lead you to church, to lead you to worship God today. So there's a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek because the old one was ineffective. There's a new law, a new testament, the law of Christ. And now in 13 and 14, we see a new tribe. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe. To no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And we've been over this same concept the last two weeks. But the startling thing about Jesus being our high priest is that he was from the wrong tribe. In his humanity here on earth at Bethlehem, his parents were from the tribe of Judah. They paid taxes in the New Testament time in Bethlehem. And Mary and Joseph had to travel at the Christmas story, clear to Bethlehem, their ancestral Judean town, and pay their taxes in Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. If you remember Moses' deathbed blessing of his sons, and when he came to Judah and laid his hand on Judah's head, he said, out of you will come the scepter. The scepter is the ruler, the king, the kingly line, the Judean kings. And Jesus was from that kingly line, the same line of David. Remember David, when he became the king and was anointed by Samuel? He was a shepherd boy in Bethlehem, six miles south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be the capital of the Judean kings. And here Jesus is all right in line to be the king. But how could Jesus be a priest too? Because the priest was never the king and the king was never the priest. And it was always, and I gave you examples a few weeks ago, how when this was violated, God came down on it. Saul sacrificed animals as the king, and Saul was removed from his kingship because of that sin. And many kings were tempted to perform the right and duties of priests, and God forbid it. In New Testament times, the Judean priesthood were both the civil and the religious leader in one person. Under the Maccabees, 167 BC, that line of John Hyrcanus and Aristobulus came right down to Jesus' day. They all combined it and did something they should have never done. And this is the situation Jesus came to, where the high priest was also the civil leader, even though the Romans were over all of Israel at that time. And so here we're presented with this case. How could Jesus from the tribe of Judah, the kingly line, how could he be qualified to be a priest, one and the same? Well, we've already seen the answer. 
because he was after a different order, not the order of Levi and Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. That's why this whole chapter, you might go, why is the Bible spending so much time on this Melchizedek figure? Because this qualifies Jesus to be king and priest at the same time. John Walbert's textbook on Christology and seminary, which I have in my library today, John Walbert says that only Jesus held all three offices at the same time. Prophet, priest, and king. I never forgot that. Jesus holds all three offices at the same time, and no one else has ever done it. It's not possible. And so he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look in verse 15. Not only a new priesthood, a new law, a new covenant, a new testament, a new tribe, the tribe of Judah, but also a new priest. Verse 15. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. Well, guess what, friends? Jesus made an appearance in Bethlehem as a baby. The word appearance is the word epiphany. He appeared. That's a Greek word. It means to appear. And, and they call Christmas time the epiphany of Jesus Christ. And he's going to make a second epiphany, isn't he? Called the second coming of Christ. And maybe in our lifetime. Amen? Amen. Man, I'll tell you. The way things are going, keep looking up. You never know what God's got in mind with everything going on in the world today. And he's going to make a second appearance, his second coming. I remember that uh, one person said the one thing every Christian in the world has in common, and that's not easy to do, <laughs> to have the one thing in common that every Christian agrees on. And I heard it was the second coming. Because Jesus said, I'm coming again. And he himself taught it, and everybody agrees that he's coming again. They might argue about when he's coming again, but he is coming again. And we all agree on that. And so here we see that Christ is predicted to appear. And in the King James Version, it says, instead of appear, it says arise. And I think that's more instructive here to use the word arise because that's a messianic title. In the Old Testament, there were many prophecies that said that he would arise, talking of Messiah. He's going to appear. He's coming to save the world. And you look at all those prophecies and you think, well, he's coming back. He's going to arise. And we see that he's coming. And notice the word if. We started off in verse 11 with the if in the second class condition. Look at this if. It's in the first class condition. And what that means, it's assumed to be true. If I was a human being, I am a human being. It's true. And so look at this. And what we have said is even more clear if, and it is true, another priest like Melchizedek arises. And the Messiah came in Jesus Christ. He was the fulfillment of predicted prophecy. Prophesied in the Old Testament that Messiah would arise, same word, he arises, and he's after a new order, the order of Melchizedek. So he's explaining to these young Hebrew Christians who were steeped in the Old Testament, Messiah has come. He's here. They called him the teacher of light in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the teacher of light has come, and he's your Messiah after the order of Melchizedek. Leave the old system. Leave the law. Leave the high priest Levitical system. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. He fulfills all of it. Jesus is all you need. Go all the way for Christ. Leave the old behind and move forward to the new. Embrace the New Testament. Embrace the new covenant. And leave the old behind. Your knee is so sore, it can't push in that clutch one more time. You can't take enough ibuprofen to keep under the Old Testament. It is a killer. It will kill you because it will not work. The problem isn't with the law. 
It's with you because you can't keep it. So here we have a new priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is true, first class condition. Not only is there a new priesthood, a new law, a new tribe, a new priest, there's a new basis. His indestructible life. Look in 16 and 17. One who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry. You remember Melchizedek? Had no father, no mother, no ancestry. This mysterious figure in Genesis 14. We saw this two weeks ago in our sermon. Here's a man who had no resume, no background. He just appeared out of nowhere, it seems. And the Levites, you had to trace your ancestry back to Levi, the priestly tribe. Even when Zacharias served John the Baptist's father in the Christmas story, he served for a two-week rotation. They had 24 courses, the way they divided up the priesthood in New Testament times, and you only had to serve once every two weeks as a priest in the temple. And so Zechariah was serving his course, his two-week time period, and even his ancestry is shown that he goes back to Levi, son of Levi. He's qualified to serve as a priest in the temple. Look at 16. One who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry. So Jesus isn't our high priest because he's from Levi, quite to the contrary but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. You can't kill Jesus. All he killed his flesh, but he rose again on the third day and lives forever. He's resurrected. He lives on high. He has an indestructible life. You can kill the body, but you can't kill the soul, is what Jesus said. And I want you to know if you have Jesus in your heart today, you have an indestructible life. Oh, they can kill the body, but they can't kill your soul. Your soul will live forever in heaven. And by the way, you're going to get a new resurrected body. Even if they killed your body in this life, you're getting a brand new one, like Jesus has today. And you're going to have a body just like Christ to live forever in heaven and enjoy him forever. And so here we see that Christ is not our priest because of regulation or ancestry, but because of his indestructible life. What other qualification do you need than that? Every one of these Levite priests died, and they appointed a new one, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. Wait till we get to chapter 9. They kept dying, and they kept appointing new ones. And the reason is because it never worked. More and more, again and again and again. But with Christ, he died once for all. One time, he's our priest forever. Amen. Because he was effective, and it works. And then here is our verse. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Notice that word forever. Christ, because he's living, never to die. Because he has an indestructible life, he's our priest forever. He is the one mediator, Timothy says, that stands between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. If you want a representative to stand with you to be your defense attorney, to stand by your side, to be your sponsor. You want a sponsor? Jesus is standing by your side, 1 John 2, 2. And he is your defense attorney. And he will present your case before God. And because of Jesus, your high priest, you'll be in heaven, enjoying God's presence forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And then finally, a new hope. Not only a new priesthood, a new law, a new tribe, a new priest, a new basis, but a new hope in 18 and 19. The former regulation, the law, Levi, uh, the book of Leviticus, all the sacrifices, the priesthood system, the former regulation was set aside. Remember what Galatians said, it was null and void, it had been crucified by Christ on the cross. And he's the new and better way. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. It was perfect in itself, but it was ineffective to accomplish 
what you need to have accomplished in your life, perfection. For the law made nothing perfect. You know what God said? In order to stand in his presence, you have to be holy. It says in 1 Peter, be ye holy, even as I am holy, thus saith the Lord. How are you going to achieve holiness, you sinners? How are you going to achieve perfection to be able to stand before God? How are you going to enter the Holy of Holies, where God's presence exists, when no one would dare go in the Holy of Holies ever? It's because Jesus Christ has torn the curtain in two and made access to God. And if you believe in Christ by faith, if you've accepted Him as your Savior, then you have access to God. You can enter into His presence. The old way, the former regulation, is now set aside, canceled. There's been a change. There's a new sheriff in town. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. It goes on to say, For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Here Jesus himself, our high priest, is called a better hope. He's called a new transmission new automatic transmission. It's a new way. Your knee will not be sore anymore. You can quit working so hard to try to achieve something that is impossible to achieve in your own flesh. And we come to this better hope. While the law was perfect, Psalm 19, 7, Romans 7, 12, Romans 7, 14, the law is perfect. Teaching us that God is holy and man is sinful, it is weak and useless, for it cannot make us perfect. In fact, the law condemns us. It does just the opposite. And you come away from the Old Testament feeling bad, that you're a sinner, and that you're not good enough, and you can't measure up, and your knee hurts so bad. And you're looking for a new and better way, a better hope. But we, together with them, and I think of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 40. We, together with them, listen to 1140. God had planned something better for us that's, that so only together with us would they be made perfect. God is not going to join the Old Testament saints with the New Testament saints because they had faith in what Christ was going to do on the cross, looking forward. We have faith looking back at the cross, but we all have faith that together with them, we're all going to be perfect in heaven with Jesus Christ, God is Father forever and ever. And so this is the new covenant, the better hope that we're being introduced to. But we together with them have a better hope introduced to us in Christ Jesus. Listen to Romans chapter 8. Uh, Debbie and I have memorized the entire chapter in high school at New Hope Christian High School. I know Romans 8 pretty well. When you have to memorize something as a kid, it sticks with you. Listen to Romans 8, 3, and 4. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. The law was powerless to save us because of our sinful nature. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. And here Jesus came and set aside the law and gave us a new nature, the nature of the spirit, the Holy Spirit living in us. And he has changed everything in our life. The old has passed, the new has come. Our founding pastor at First Community Bible Church was Pastor Earl Best. 1956, he founded this church down here at the corner, the old store. Built the first building two years later, 1958, right back there. The old pine site is still in the wire room. You can see that. And Earl Best was my pastor. 
His word is not mine. And God changed his life. And he followed the Lord into the ministry of the Bible College in the 50s. Uh, the teachers came down here to Roosh to survey the community to see if there was enough people here to have a church. They concluded it was. And they started this church, the first one. And uh, the word of God was coming to the Applegate Valley. And uh, there were other churches a lot earlier than that, Williams, back to the 1800s, but not in this valley. And so we praise God for our best and the vision that God gave him to establish this church. And we keep it going. Amen. 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 The word, word of God going here. And so, so we see that there's a better hope. And it was introduced to us by Christ, our permanent priest or king. The law, we find out in Hebrews 10.1, is only a shadow of better things to come. Hebrews 10.1, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. The law was a big arrow that was pointing to better things to come, Jesus Christ. Let's leave the old in the past. Let's, let's appreciate it in what it was given for, to teach us that we were sinners. But let's leave it in the past. Let's move on to new and better things, along with the Old Testament saints. And this is where we live today. I put down in the outline, the law was a shadow, but the reality is Christ. The law was pointing to Christ. And we need to embrace the reality, not the shadow. Robert Hughes, who wrote the, the most number one popular commentary on the book of Hebrews still today, wrote it in the mid-90s. He said, the author is in effect pleading with the readers not to revert to the imperfection of the old and outmoded system. I'm pleading with you to leave the way of works, of human endeavor, of a system of work, of religion. Whatever your religion is, leave it. I can only reach up to eight feet. Leave it. Accept Christ who came all the way down to save you. Accept the new system that works. Accept a better hope. Receive Christ as your Savior. Your knee won't hurt anymore. You'll be driving an automatic transmission when Christ is driving the car with you. And His Holy Spirit is right next to you and He's in your life. And He's right with you. And you will make it to heaven on your journey. And you'll have a smile on your face knowing that it was effective. This better hope in Christ is the basis upon which we can draw near to God. Look at verse uh, 18 and 19 again. The former regulation was set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect, but a better hope is introduced by which, what? We draw near to God. James 5 says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. I always like it this way. You take one step, he takes one step. You take another, he takes another. And pretty soon, you meet. Would you take one step toward God today? Would you just take a baby step? I know you're probably scared. No matter where you're listening or what your life situation is, would you take one baby step toward God? Because God will take a baby step toward you. He might even take a full step to you if you take a baby step toward him. Because I know God. He'll meet you more than halfway if you will but trust in him and draw near to God. I'm pleading with you, like the author says, to leave the old and embrace the new. And the better way is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only thing that will keep any Christian church united is not politics. It's not coronavirus practices.
my old way of living. I'm through with all my trying. I'm, I'm through with laws and regulations and do's and don'ts. I'm ready to move on. My knee's so sore I can't get it in the next gear. I want to turn to you, Lord Jesus, a better hope, a better way, a new and living way, an anger for the soul. And I want to embrace you, the new covenant, the law of love, love one another. And Lord Jesus, I want you to save my soul. I want you to make me perfect. I want you to live my life. I want to live in you. And I want to put it on cruise control of Jesus Christ today on my way to heaven. Father, we just pray that you might save a soul listening to this message today. They might give their life completely to you and leave the old in the past and move on to new, a better hope. Father, we pray for this old world that we're living in. It seems to be falling apart more and more each day. And we're troubled to know what to make of it. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Help us to be prepared with you on our side. We love you, Lord Jesus. Keep your church united as we wait for your coming. God bless us all.